Good morning, everybody. Everybody have a great start to the new year. I mean, we're three days in. Has everyone kept their New Year's resolution so far? I'm one of those people that I was like, I'm going to eat healthier in 2021. And now it's like, that starts Monday. <laughs> oh, well, like uh, we're, we mentioned, we're kicking off a brand new series this morning called uh, Make Waves. And I'm really excited for this series because it's an opportunity for us to talk about who we are as a church. And even as I was thinking about and pondering, like, what does it look like? What does it mean for us as people or as a church to make waves? I was taken back to really my days growing up in Southern California. Growing up in Southern California, your summers are spent in pools. I imagine very similar to growing up out in this area or living out in this area, your summers are spent in the lake. We are drawn to water. And, and I, I remember growing up as a kid, one of my favorite things to do in a pool was uh, literally to stand at the shallow end of the pool, facing the deep end of the pool. And I would throw my arms out wide, and then I would just use my whole body and just fall into the water. Like, I don't know, you guys ever done that before? Like, it's just kind of a fun thing to do. Um, but I had a purpose behind it. I wasn't just falling into the water because it was fun. I wanted to actually see if I could get the water to start moving. And so I would literally stand there and I would fall forward in the water. And I would see as I came up out of the water the ripple effects, the small waves that I was making. They would, you know, move down the pool, ultimately hitting the deep end of the pool before they started coming back at me. But I didn't want to do this just once, right? I wanted to do it again and again and again. And so I would, I would fall down, I'd get up, I'd throw my arms out, I'd fall down again, and I would try to move as much water as I could because I wanted to make waves in the pool. And what was surprising to me is honestly, with very little effort, and after just a few moments, the whole pool would be moving. Water would be you know, going down to one end, it would be meeting the waves that were coming back down the other end. And I say that because as we talk about what does it look like for us to make waves in our lives as individuals, but also what does it look like for us to make waves when it comes to who we are as a church, what I want us to understand is that with a little intentionality and honestly just a little effort, we can make a profound difference in the lives of people in our community and around the world, both individually and as a church. And so the next couple of weeks, we're gonna talk about what this looks like. We're gonna talk about what does it look like for us to live out our mission to help people find and follow Jesus. And so, so this morning, we're gonna talk about what does it look like to help people find Jesus. Next week, we're gonna talk about what does it look like to help people follow Jesus. And then week three, we're going to talk about some you know, practical ways we plan to do that as a church this upcoming year in 2021. But also, the last week of this series, we want to give you an opportunity to have some of the questions that you might have about what does it look like for us as a church to do this, to live this out? Or what does it look like for you personally to do this or live this out? We want to create a space and some time to answer some of those questions. And so if I say something this morning or if I say something next week, or if there's something that you've just been wondering about or pondering when it comes to us helping people find and follow Jesus, I wanna invite you to send those questions. You can email them to questions at lakesawyerchurch.org, questions at lakesawyerchurch.org, questions, and it'll be in the chat window if you're online, at lakesawyerchurch.org, and uh, we'll, on week three, spend some time to answer as many of those questions as we can. But like I mentioned this morning, we're going to talk about that first piece of what it looks like to make waves. We're going to talk about how we can help people find Jesus. And really, the heart behind that is words that come from Jesus himself. In the Gospel, which is one of the books that tells us, is there's three books, or four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that tell us about the life and the teachings of Jesus. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus shares really what is known as the Great Commission. It's the heart that motivates these actions. It was words that it was shared to Jesus' closest followers, but they're also words that are applied to us today. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 28, in verse 19. He says, therefore go, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. And this is not so much like a, an action verb, like right now, go. Like, you know, go. It's, it's more like as you go. Like as you go about your life, as you live your day in and day out, as you go to the work, as you go to work, make disciples at your workplace. As you go to the grocery store, make disciples at in the grocery store. As, you, as you're in your homes, make disciples in your home. Help 
people find Jesus, the people that God has placed around you. And in each of us, we have this unique experience of you people that God has placed in the proximity of our lives. Use those moments. Seize the opportunities that we have to help people find Jesus. Now, I understand that it's easy enough to say that. It's easy to say like, hey, everybody, let's just go and help people find Jesus. We understand it maybe mentally, but actually uh, applying it in our lives looks a little bit different. It's, it's probably hard for some of us. Like, what does it look like to, to live a life that, that models or, or, or is an example for others of who Jesus is? And, and how do we share it with others? Again, to the connection of knowing and understanding it and actually doing it is difficult for many of us, which is why I think it's helpful to see it played out in the life of someone else. And in the Bible, there is a story of a man who shows us what it looks like to leverage a person's life to help people find Jesus. And that example, that person's life that we come across is found in the book of Acts. Now, as we join with the story in Acts, what's important for us to understand is that the church in this time is under an incredible amount of persecution. They're being persecuted at the hands of the, uh, of the religious leaders of, of, the, of the Israelites. They are attacking this, this new burgeoning group of Christians because of what they believe, of, because of who they say Jesus is. And really the person that's kind of spearheading this whole thing is a man named Saul. And so Saul is basically going around and he is, uh, he's just, he's doing horrible things to Christians because at the core, they refuse to stop talking about who Jesus is. That they wanted to tell everyone who would listen about who Jesus was for them in their lives and who Jesus could be for those people in their lives. And in chapter seven, we are, uh, we are introduced or we come across a story of a young man named Stephen. And Stephen is just, uh, in chapter 7, he's being executed. He's being killed for this very thing. He's being killed because he won't stop telling people about who Jesus is. And now when Stephen gets killed, this obviously sparks some fear within the people in the church in the area. They see what happened to Stephen and they imagine, well, if this could happen to Stephen, then it's possible that what happened to him could also happen to them as well. And so they do a very logical thing. And in, in, in light of what has just happened to Stephen, I think I would probably do the same thing. They decide it's better to pack up and leave to pack up and to move away from their ancestral homeland, to move away from really uh, much of what many of them have known for, for their entire lives, to start life over someplace else. Now you would think, you would think if, if this action caused your whole life to get disrupted, if, if sharing Jesus with others is what caused Stephen to get killed, is what caused others to, to be persecuted, if that caused you to have to uproot and move somewhere else, then it would be logical to conclude that you probably wouldn't want to continue the same action that brought about the persecution to begin with. Okay, that's, that's what I would logically think, but that's not what they did. That wasn't their story, that even though life might look different now, their purpose remained the same. And this is what Luke tells us in Acts chapter 8 in verse 4. He says, those who had been scattered, these Christ followers who had been scattered, preached the word wherever they went. That they shared Jesus in this new place, wherever that new place was. That, that, that sharing Christ might have cost them their home, but it wasn't going to cost them the opportunity to share his life and securing someone else's future. And so they told people. They told people about this life-giving hope and promise that can only be found in Jesus. And one of those individuals that were told, one of the people that were scattered that continued to share Jesus with others was a man named Philip. Philip landed in the town of Samaria, which is about 40 miles north of Jerusalem. And if you're familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan, the Samaritan would have come from Samaria. It wasn't a town, a region, an area that was held in high regard of some of the religious elite of the day, but this is where Philip ends up. And when Philip gets to Samaria, he does what we're told the believers who've been scattered do. He shares Jesus 
with the town. He shares Jesus with those who would listen to him. And what happens, their response to this message is something that we need to take note of. This is what we're told in verse 6. When the crowds heard Philip, when they heard what Philip was saying and they saw the signs that he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. The things that Philip said and the way that he conducted, the way that he held himself, the way that he lived his life invited the people to lean in and to hear more. That there was something about him that piqued the interest in other people. And I think that's important for us to understand, especially when it comes to how we leverage our lives, how we go about using what God has done in our lives to help someone else find him. What we say and how we live is just as important as what we say. That as Philip is sharing, people are leaning in. They're not running away and screaming. And I'm sure we've probably had both those experiences. Maybe not just with someone sharing their faith, but we've had experiences in life where someone is sharing about their life or what experience they had, and, and we're, we're, just, we're, we're just mesmerized. We, we want to lean in. We want to hear more. We want to know what they have to say. We've had those experiences, right? But we've also probably had experiences where like, we're so off-put by someone that we'd rather just like, run away than have to listen to what this person said. Again, You've had those experiences. I've had those same experiences. One of them actually happened uh, a year ago. A, a year ago, I went to a preseason football game of the Seattle Seahawks and the, uh, the I guess now, Las Vegas Raiders. And uh, I was blessed with the opportunity to go to that game by a family uh, who's in the church here. And they, they recognized that even though I'm not a Seahawks fan, uh, I, I'm a good person, so I couldn't possibly be a Raiders fan. And so they knew that if they took, gave me tickets to the game, I'd go to the game and go Hawks. And so I, I decided to take my, my dad and my, my girls. We decided to go to the game together. And we were excited. Like, you know, they wore Seahawks gear. Uh, I didn't wear Seahawks gear. I didn't wear Raiders gear. I didn't wear Seahawks gear, but I, I went to the game, and we get down to, 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 to CenturyLink or Lumen Field or, I don't know what it's called anymore, but we get down to the stadium, and there's like literally thousands of people back in the day in the time where thousands of people could be together. And there's thousands of people out on the streets, and there's energy on the streets, and there's people that are filing into the stadium, and excitement's building as it's getting closer and closer uh, to kick off. And as we're making our way towards the stadium, there is a, a handful of people who are out there in front of the stadium with large signs and bullhorns telling everyone who's coming that they have to repent or they're going to go to hell that they need to confess their sins and invite Jesus into their lives. They need to acknowledge they have a need for a savior or they'll spend eternity apart from, um, from Christ. They'll spend eternity apart from God. And I have to tell you, it was pretty off-putting. It was pretty off-putting as we were walking up and, and they're shouting and, and, and they're obviously wanting to make sure everyone knows where they're coming from. And it's off-putting not just to me, but my girls are asking me questions like, what are they doing? Is this what you should be doing? And, and it's definitely off-putting to the thousands of fans who are, who are shouting back to them, um, only using words that I can't use here from the stage. But, you know, it's this interesting experience. And, and as I kind of like walked my girls through that, like what was just happening, there was an acknowledgement, and this is the tension that everything they were saying, everything they were saying is right, that we do need Jesus, that we are sinners in need of a savior, that apart from Christ, we will spend eternity uh, away from God, that we will spend eternity um, without being in his presence. Like what they're saying is absolutely right, but I also wanted my girls to understand that how you say it, how you conduct yourselves is almost as important, if not more important, than the words you're saying. And for some reason, this is what that group of people seem to never understand, but it's what Philip understand, understood very, very clearly. And because he understood it, because he was mindful of the way he conducted himself, because he was mindful of the words that he shared, people were drawn to him. They wanted to know what he had to say. And this is the best part. This was the city's response to Philip sharing the good news of Christ. Again, it was very clear what the response of the people was at the Seahawks game. This was the city's response. Acts 8, verse 8. 
So there was great joy in that city. So just let that sink in for a second. Someone went into the city and proclaimed Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world, and the city rejoiced. The city celebrated. They were filled with joy because someone shared and acted in the name of Jesus. And eventually, this news made its way from Samaria back down to Jerusalem, to the disciples who weren't scattered, who were still there in Jerusalem. And they began to talk among themselves, like, could this be? Could it be that Samaria has actually responded to the word of God? They began to talk about themselves on this report, and they decided to send Peter and John up to Samaria to check it out. And when they got there, they realized They realized that everything that they heard was correct, that it was right, that what Philip had done was actually truthful. And they rejoiced. They too celebrated and they responded. They literally, uh, they prayed for these new believers. They baptized these new believers. And they asked God to pour his spirit upon them, which is exactly what happened. It was a powerful, powerful movement of God that was only made possible because of the faithfulness of Philip. Because Philip would seize any opportunity that God gave him to share his faith with others. But what's impressive to me about Philip's story is not that he did it once. I think think many of us could muster up the courage to share our faith one time. What, What blows me away about Philip's story is his willingness to do this again and again and again and again. And if you're familiar with Philip's story, you know what's, what's happening. You know what happens in the, uh, the life as it unfolds for him. In verse 26, we're told that an angel of the Lord comes to Philip and instructs Philip to go to the desert road. The desert road was an ancient road that connected Jerusalem to Gaza, and he wanted Philip to go there. He didn't really give direct instruction to why he was to go there, but here's what's important for us to understand. When Philip is told to go to the desert road, this isn't a day trip. This isn't like, hey, Philip, can you head down to the desert road for today? Just go down there. I'm going to do something you don't really know yet, but just go there. What, what literally the angel's asking Philip to do is to start over again, literally to uproot his life, to leave everything that he just built in Samaria to go someplace else to do this new thing that God was calling him to do. Now, here's, here's the thing. If I was Philip, I would have like spinning lights behind me. Those, that just happened, right? I'm not crazy? Okay. If I was, that was well, well timed, guys. If I was Philip, I would be like, no, no, God, no thank you. Like, hey, look, I, I, I did this. I came here to Samaria. I, I, I did a good thing, and there was fruitful work here. I was faithful. People responded because of my faithfulness. Like, can't I just stay here, God? Like, can I just. Can I just stay in Samaria? Like, can can somebody else go to the desert road? I mean, can I just bask in the goodness and the glory of what I've already done? And by all accounts, Philip is pretty much a celebrity at this point in Samaria. Like, no way. There's no way that he wants to leave and to start life over again someplace else. Like, that, that can't be what he's thinking. It wouldn't be what I was thinking. Now, here's the thing. One of the things I love most about the Bible is that no matter how jacked up my life is, or no matter how much I'm struggling with things in my life, I can open up the pages of Scripture and I find stories of people whose lives are very similar to my own, whose struggles are very similar to my own. I love that about the Word of God. But one of the other things I love about the Word of God is I open up its pages and I find stories about people whose lives are totally different than my own whose faith is so much stronger than my own. And that's inspiring. And Philip is one of those people. Philip is one of those people who inspire me to do more, to be better. Philip was a man of faith, willing to follow after God regardless of where it led him or what he had to sacrifice to do it. And so honestly, Philip did what I probably wouldn't do. 
He packed up his life in Samaria and he set out back on the road. And as he's on this journey to the desert road, we're told that he encounters a man, an Ethiopian eunuch who um, had just come from Jerusalem. The eunuch's position is important because it talks about this making waves, this, this impact that goes beyond ourselves. Uh, the, the eunuch was essentially the treasury secretary for the queen of Ethiopia. And as, they, as he was traveling down to the desert road, as this Ethiopian was traveling back home, we see that God orchestrated their connection. God opens a door and Philip steps through the door. This is what we read in verse 30. Then Philip, at the prompting of the angel, ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked. Philip asked a very clear but very important question. He says to the man, do you understand what you are reading? Now, he's not asking the man if he knows how to read. He's not like, hey, do you need me to read this to you? He wants to know if he understands the significance of what he's reading. Does he understand what Isaiah is saying? More importantly, does he understand that Isaiah is pointing to Jesus? Philip wants to know if this Ethiopian gets who Jesus is and what Jesus can mean for this man's life. And this is his response, the man's response. He says, how can I? How can I unless someone explains it to me? And so he invited Philip to come and to sit with him. And that's exactly what Philip did. Philip stopped and he took the time to sit with this man. He took the time to help this man understand the word of God, to help the man understand what God was doing in his life. He created the space. And it's so important because many of us are so busy, we don't think we have any space. Philip was busy, but he created the space to talk to this man about what matters most in life. And Philip helped this man, this Ethiopian, cross the line of faith. He helped him find Jesus. And as they traveled down the road together in the Ethiopian's chariot, chariot, they eventually came to a stream of water where the man looked at Philip and said, look, verse 37, here is water. I mean, what can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Philip baptized this man, an act that symbolizes the dying to oneself, the, 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 the death of our sins, uh, 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 raising up to walk a new life. In Christ. And as quickly as God had orchestrated this meeting between Philip and this Ethiopian, God moved Philip once again. That after this moment, Philip would go away never to see the Ethiopian again. And I want us to take note of what the Ethiopian's response is. This is his response to encountering Philip. This is his response to that experience, he being the Ethiopian in verse 39, went on his way rejoicing. The Ethiopian went on his way rejoicing. That every single time, every time that Philip helps someone find Jesus, they walk away with joy. They rejoice because they get a taste of life, true life, everlasting life. And for Philip, for Philip, this is the point. This is the point where he's supposed to hear. This is the point that I would want to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. Like, Philip didn't just do this once, but Philip did it twice. Like, surely at this point, he has to be done. Like, God can use someone else moving forward. But if there was ever an opportunity, if there was ever a chance to tell someone about Jesus... Philip would run towards that opportunity. He would never, ever stop. In verse 40, we're told that Philip 
appeared at Azotus, that Philip went from where he was on that desert road, ended up at Azotus, and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. That Philip literally dedicated his life, his entire life, to helping people find Jesus. Now, it would be easy. It would be easy for us to say, well, Philip is special. Like, Philip is unique. Like, Phil, Philip's got this gift. This is like his calling. It's, it's like what he does. That's why he's in the Bible. Like, it's, it's his thing. It's not our thing. But the reality is none of us, not a single one of us who considers ourselves Christ followers can escape Jesus' words. That we are called. We are called to go into the world and make disciples. We are called to go into the world and help people find Jesus. Like, no one gets a get-out-of-jail-free card with that. No one gets to opt out of that responsibility. That's not an option. This was Philip's calling, but it's also your calling. This is what you are called to do. This is what I am called to do. This is what Jesus commands us to do. And the reality is, as I look at Philip's life, I don't think it's about gifting. I mean, obviously he's got some skills. The more you do things, the better you become at things. Like, like in life, the things that we, have, we pride ourselves on, the things that we're good at, maybe some of our hobbies, you've perfected that skill or you've gotten better with that skill through practice. Like, I don't think Philip has this unique gifting. I think he just uses the opportunities and he grows through those opportunities. So it's not a gifting that I see in Philip. What I see in Philip is passion and availability. That Philip has a passion and he makes himself available. That he's absolutely passionate about Jesus, about what Jesus has meant to him in his life and he wants other people to know his savior. He wants them to know what he knows. He wants them to have eternity like he knows he has eternity. And if we don't feel the same way, if we don't have that same passion, I think we really need to look inside and begin to ask ourselves why. Now I'm going to be honest with you. I don't always have this passion. I don't always jump for joy when it comes to opportunities to share my faith with other people. Because even though, honestly, it's gone really well for Philip, I think there's probably experiences for him where it hasn't gone so well. There's been experiences for me where it hasn't gone so well. But I need to look past that. I need to look past the fear. I need to look past the worry. I need to look into my heart. You need to look into your heart. And you need to ask God, why don't you have that same passion? Like, if we really believe that Jesus is our Savior, if we really believe that Jesus changed everything for me and that Jesus can change everything for everyone, then why don't we have the passion to share it with others? What is going on inside our heart? Where is our passion when it comes to this important principle? The other thing I see in Philip is his availability. That Philip always allowed himself to be available to what God was doing. I'm sure like many of us, Philip had other things going on. Like many of us, Philip's life was busy. But if God opened the door, if God created a chance, then Philip was willing to drop everything. Philip was willing to rearrange his schedule. He was willing to let go of the things that he had planned for the thing that God had planned for him and to follow and to lean in to what that was. Philip continually made himself available. And the truth is many of us don't. Or we do. We make ourselves available to God at church on Sundays And then we plan out the rest of our week. But what would happen tomorrow if God tapped you on the shoulder and said, hey, today I want you to do this. And I know you have work. I know you have all these other expectations. But would you be available for what I'm calling you to do? 
And if we're prioritizing our schedules over what God is calling us to do, then we've got the wrong priorities. For Philip, it was about passion and about availability. For us, it has to be about passion and about availability. And I think what made Philip so unique is this wasn't an obligation. This wasn't something he had to do. I think that's why he, people respond so favorably to him because he understands it for what it is. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to help someone understand what life could really be like, what life should be like as God has designed it to be. And he seized those opportunities. And as long as we're looking at it as an obligation, we won't come across with the same joy that Philip did. We need to see it as an opportunity. So I want to invite you really uh, this week to do two things. One, I want you to spend some time praying. A very, very, very directed prayer to say, God, help ignite the passion of my heart. Like at some point, all of us, and maybe you're in a season right now where this is true, but at some point, all of us, we're on fire when it comes to our faith. Like, we wanted every single person to know what we know. And that fire, that passion for many of us has faded. So this week, I want to ask you to pray. God, reignite that fire. Reignite that passion to share you with others. The second thing I want you to do is I want you to write a list. I want you to write a list of people in your life who need Jesus. Just begin writing them down. Put it on your phone. Put it on a piece of paper. Write a list of those people and then pick one of them and specifically pray for that person. Pray for an opportunity to begin to build or to deepen a relationship that you have with them. Pray for opportunities that you can begin to share your faith. Pray for opportunities to hear their stories, to get to know their struggles, and their joys, and then be willing to step in and to share your story, your struggles, and your joy. Be willing to share how Jesus changed everything in your life, and then seize those opportunities. That's what happens down the road. But this week, two things. Pray for God to reignite your passion for those who are far from Christ. Secondly, Choose one person and begin specifically praying for opportunities to deepen or to build a relationship with that person. Do that every single day. And I promise you, God will open up a door for you. And I promise you that as you step through that door, you'll be stepping into the very thing that God has called you to do, to help people find Jesus.